let, let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Jeremy Thomas, but before I do that, I, I do want to talk about a couple things related to the presentation. We do have, um, I, I plan to uh, mute participants during the presentation and then after the presentation, we'll, we'll uh, unmute everybody. Also, uh, you can ask questions in the chat or add comments in the chat function. And we plan to give 20 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for questions and comments. And then following uh, this presentation and the, the questions, we will post the recording to the library YouTube channel. So with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Jeremy Thomas. Dr. Jeremy Thomas, Chair of the Department of Sociology, Social Work and Criminology, is the recipient of the 2019 GEM Teaching Award for Social and Behavioral Ways of Knowing from the Idaho State Board of Education, as well as a 2021 Textbook Hero Award winner from the Eli M. Obler Library Open and Affordable Educational Resources Committee. As Department Chair, Dr. Thomas has been leading efforts to eliminate all textbooks costs for the department's general education courses. And in doing so, the department is now collectively saving students more than $50,000 per academic year. He is currently serving as co-chair of the ISU Open Educational Resources Committee. All right, so with that, I will mute myself and I'll mute uh, other participants and we'll turn the time over to Dr. Thomas. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Spencer. I'm gonna share my screen. And are we in business? All right, excellent. So I'm uh, very happy to be able to uh, share a little bit about our project here in the Department of Sociology, Social Work and Criminology. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, so I'm the department chair, but I'm also by disciplinary background, a sociologist. So I wanna just kind of give an overview specifically for what we've done with our gen ed course, Introduction to Sociology, SOC 101. So just a little bit of overview for my presentation. I wanna actually go a little bit back in time and kind of provide you all with a little bit of a timeline in history for SOC 101. And I'm actually gonna talk a bit about an earlier redevelopment or development process we did with this course a couple of years back. So I think it really kind of informs how we got to where we are. And I think there's some important lessons to be thinking about trajectories of development. And so then I'll kind of come and speak uh, particularly about our process last year in 2021, kind of the decision-making process and some of the design and implementation choices. And then I wanna reflect with you all uh, a little bit on cost benefit analysis and also some uh, leadership lessons. So I think some interesting pieces here and kind of wanna just lead you through some of what we have done. So just as kind of even preface to that, I came to ISU in 2012 and uh, as a new assistant professor and teaching uh, introduction to sociology and other courses like that, I'll give you a little bit of history of kind of what was going on there and some of the things that we had in the department, how those kind of informed where we're at now. So from about 2012 to about 2019, we had what I would consider a lot of pedagogical variation with regard to this uh, fundamental course, Social 101, Introduction to Sociology. And so uh, like a lot of gen ed courses, we did uh, multiple sections, many five, six, seven, eight sections per uh, fall and spring semester. We taught it in summer semesters and it was taught variously by professors, uh, by a number of adjunct instructors over the years and also by uh, advanced, uh, our teaching assistants, advanced graduate students. And so perhaps not unlike a lot of places, we had just a lot of variety in how this course was taught. We had a wide variety of textbooks, course materials, course designs, kind of the whole range of different professors, adjuncts, TAs, uh, having different preferences for how this course would be taught. Now, I would say by and large, uh, during this kind of span of years, 2012, 2019, very excellent professors who taught this course very well, but they did so with a lot of differing content. Uh, while there's kind of some standardization and introduction to sociology, sociology is a pretty wide and uh, very diverse field. 
And so in a course like Intro to Sociology, you can actually take it a lot of different ways. And that's what we had. And so we actually had a lot of different Social 101 courses and they varied in difficulty. One of the things we found with adjuncts is our adjuncts, perhaps not atypically varied in quality. And we also had TAs teaching who kind of in my kind of retroactive assessment were often underprepared and kind of just threw them into it, which is one strategy for TAs, but I'm not sure is the best uh, kind of approach. Also, when we're kind of specifically, specifically thinking about the context of OER, the textbook cost uh, varied a lot, but it was often kind of in the $100 to $180 range. So that went on for a number of years. In 2019, I led a process uh, for thinking about redeveloping Social 101. And this was kind of reflected uh, kind of concerns that emerged within our department based on a lot of this diversity. So one of the things we had uh, that was kind of a concern is that subsequent courses, so Social 101 formed the prerequisite for a lot of our uh, major courses and subsequent courses in the department. We found that there was unequal preparation of students for subsequent courses. Now, sometimes this was just kind of in more of a general quality, but it was often with particular content areas. So one uh, professor's Social 101 of course would address particular content. A different instructor would ad address different content. And this was provide or uh, kind of, uh, causing some issues for us. We also had the kind of student complaints about variation and difficulty. And certainly with regard to thinking about OER, we had a lot of student concerns about textbook costs. So as I said earlier, some of our instructors are using maybe $100 textbooks, some up to $180. And obviously uh, that was a concern. And so what we often would have was for an intro course like this, a gen ed course like this, a lot of students simply didn't buy the textbook uh, because $180 textbook was quite expensive. And that of course caused other kinds of problems. Another factor is that uh, sociology content was added to the MCAT and we were delivering that for a lot of uh, uh, students in the health uh, professions. And so we needed to more consistently address some of those expectations. So kind of as part of this 2019 uh, redevelopment that I led, we essentially developed a standardized or at least substantially standardized Social 101 course. Uh, I led a review of a number of textbooks, uh, kind of traditional published for-profit kinds of textbooks, looked across a wide uh, range, reviewed about 10 different textbooks in a, in a fairly substantial manner, thinking about different uh, content, quality, price. Um, I ultimately, and with a couple other faculty members, proposed a short list of sociology faculty and we very intentionally chose out of those lists, uh, out of those uh, Social 101 textbooks, a relatively affordable one, among the most affordable one of uh, kind of the standard textbook model. We chose a $60 textbook roughly. And then we also chose a supplemental text. So of $20, about $80 for new text, which of course was substantially cheaper than what we have been uh, doing. We also created a standardized course that uh, kind of a shell or kind of a, a basic version that could be variously adapted for classroom settings, for synchronous online and for asynchronous online teaching. Also kind of developed um, syllabus, activities, assessments, and some other supplemental resources. So kind of give this here because this was kind of a key step into thinking about how we later, just more recently have moved to OER. So just a couple of reflections on that 2019 process. I think we fairly immediately saw some overall quality gains through this standardization. And this was particularly the case, I think, with some of our adjunct instructors, and especially for teaching assistants, being able to provide our graduate students with a well-developed course of well-developed resources really made a big difference. And I think the overall quality of our Social 101 instruction. Um, we also did some other kinds of things with some efficiency gains. We had previously used a lot of teaching assistants to teach uh, their own uh, relatively small sections, asynchronous online sections, of Social 101, and we moved instead to a model where we had a, uh, a single for each semester, a single large Social 101 uh, section that we used for training teaching assistants and that I kind of used as a mentoring and developing opportunity and also give those uh, teaching assistants, those graduate students opportunities to lecture in other courses. And then we kind of used that for training so that they could go on to uh, teach their own typically classroom sections in subsequent semesters. So that was a pretty major effort. And we did invest some substantial resources in kind of going through those processes in many kinds of decision points. And overall, I would say we were quite happy with that. And as I uh, uh, explained there, we did reduce our overall costs 
to about $60 for a textbook and about $20 for a supplemental text, which was substantial savings. And I think students appreciated that, increased access, and that was a very good move. We probably would have stayed with that textbook that we you know, went through the substantial process and would have stayed with that textbook longer, except in fall 2020, so we, we adopted that textbook uh, beginning fall 2019, just one year later, that textbook publisher announced that a new edition was coming fall 2021, but it wasn't just kind of a, uh, an incremental or a minor update. It was a pretty major update was coming to this textbook that we had just selected uh, and put into implementation a year prior. And one of the, it was, this was a bit frustrating because we had developed a lot of supplemental resources around that textbook that we adopted in uh, beginning fall 2019. And we had kind of uh, found ways to design the course around and accentuate the course in various kinds of ways. And this new textbook, uh, this new edition of the textbook that was coming was going to be really quite different. And I'm, I, I think it, they were good ideas on the part of the publisher, but it was going to require some substantial work and we had just invested some substantial work. So that really led or became a motivation for us just thinking, okay, we did a lot of design kind of in-house work with this textbook that we had selected already. What if we just went all the way and thought maybe now's a good time to instead of doing kind of re-adaptation to this new edition of this paid textbook, what if we just looked for an OER option and went ahead and kind of made the full jump to OER and really tried to eliminate uh, all textbook costs uh, for Social 101. So about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, January of uh, 2021, we began to really uh, kind of work through this as a, sociolog a sociology faculty and think about the possibility of moving to OER. So a lot of motivating factors that would probably be pretty standard for OER, we were definitely interested in saving students money. So we'd already done some savings and that had clearly been appreciated. And we think also that just moving to that level of savings had increased enrollment and access for Social 101. And we definitely wanted to do that further. We had also recently uh, moved another one of our gen gen ed courses to OER kind of a semester prior. And we had heard really good feedback from students, uh, kind of appreciation for that, also opportunities for customization. So we had a pretty good experience with that on a separate course. And we were kind of at a point where we knew that it was just a matter of time that we ultimately wanted to get to the place of transitioning all of our gen ed courses to OER. Faculty also liked the idea of being a little bit less at the mercy of textbook publishers with regard to changes that they might make. And we kind of take a little bit more control in-house, especially when we thought about how textbooks get paired with supplemental materials. So I, uh, about a year ago then, I led, again, kind of re, uh, redoing my role from 2019. I led an initial review of some existing OER options for introduction to sociology. Admittedly, there weren't a lot, really only two to three legitimate or viable OER textbook options. And probably with any of these, we were essentially going to do a hybrid format where we would take an OER textbook that exists and pair it with other materials that we developed. Um, so some of the concerns, and I think it's kind of important to think about broadly, is uh, our faculty internally has some concerns about quality. Uh, would an OER textbook be the same quality? And we're thinking about not just for an individual text, but also for supplemental resources, including things like question banks. Um, development workload, who was going to do all this, kind of rehashing some of the questions about autonomy versus standardization. Admittedly, there was some kind of distrust with the State Board of Education. We, some of our faculty felt like we were kind of participating in processes that were, again, kind of reducing autonomy. Um, and so we kind of worked through those and talked through those systematically. I would say that there was some mix of opinion but overall, we lean toward being uh, kind of a favorable opinion of going for, forward like this. Some of our faculty felt like kind of we had already reduced the cost of the text and it really wasn't necessary to do anything further. But ultimately, we decided to proceed. So last summer, I then really oversaw and, and kind of led this development. Uh, we selected an OpenStax text intro to sociology, the third edition. Uh, we basically did a, took a lot of the work we had done a couple of years ago and entered uh, or in, uh, included this new text into that. Of course, there was a lot of design and kind of uh, adaptations or you know kind of reworking of things. 
we did a pretty substantial question bank development slash redevelopment. We actually funded a former graduate student of ours to write a lot of questions and to adapt some ones that we had written previously, kind of update things. Uh, we had a couple other former, uh, or uh, with that former graduate student, um, I worked substantially with that student to also develop new activities and assignments that kind of matched with the textbook. And we also did a lot of redevelopment of uh, and adding of online resources. So our current kind of version of the course has a lot of links to uh, uh, websites, to articles and videos. We also included some journal articles and a pretty substantial amount of effort. We did kind of an initial development last uh, May and June, uh, worked pretty intensely. Uh, this graduate student, former graduate student, and me worked fairly intensely on that. And then we uh, were able to fund a couple of other current graduate students of ours to do a lot of review, refinement, and checking on the materials that we developed. So we went through, and we not we had multiple people at, by this point who went through kind of every question that we put in our question bank, and we cross-checked, and we checked for clarity, we checked for difficulty. We got multiple opinions on assignments and resources, uh, and we made numerous corrections, clarifications, and changes. So me, uh, a former graduate student to current graduate students. And then we also ran many of these changes kind of at a higher level back through sociology faculty. So it's really a team effort with really a lot of, uh, a lot of commitment and a lot of effort involved. So we implemented that this last fall, uh, beginning in August 21, kind of as part of that process. So we're talking about eight sections last fall. Um, I led multiple training sessions, and by training sessions, I mean trying to, working with faculty and instructors, okay, here's what we're doing, here's how it works, here's how Moodle works, here's how all these different options work, uh, here's how the test bank works, and I, I think it's kind of an important note to remember those are substantial efforts in and of themselves, just to kind of get people up to speed with these kinds of things and explaining, okay, here's kind of a baseline version of the course. Here's how you can teach it in a classroom. Here's how you can teach it async online. Here's how you can teach it synchronous online. One of the things we realized right off the bat, like week two or three in the semester, is that not everything was perfect. We knew it wasn't going to be perfect off the bat, but it, and it wasn't. Uh, so we developed, for example, shared documents where uh, various instructors could put alerts, problem uh, quiz questions, problems with an assignment, uh, questions about syllabus, questions about policies, and created this kind of interactive document for things that needed to be fixed and redeveloped. Some of those we fixed on the fly. They're like, oh, there's problems with an assignment. Let's fix it. Some of those things were not easily fixed in the middle semester, and we made notes. Uh, at the end of uh, this last fall semester in December, we had a debriefing meeting. We met and we gathered all the instructors together as well as teaching assistants, assistants who had worked with them. And we thought, what went well? What didn't go so well? How can we uh, fix this? And um, I would just say over the winter break, I did quite a bit of fixing myself. So I made numerous corrections, updates, and then we got that going for the spring semester. And then we are continuing to identify areas and this summer, we're going to do some more development, probably get some more graduate students involved. We know we want to strengthen and update our question bank. We know we need to redevelop uh, some assignments. Uh, overall, I mean, I would say I think things went very, very well. And we have a very strong course. I think the best course that we've had in the 10 years that I've been here at ISU, I've been very happy with the results. But we also know that there is need to do further development, further correction. So one of the things that's been uh, kind of a reality with having a lot of online resources. So links to newspaper articles and links to online videos is that those things are dynamic and they change and we don't control uh, access. And so kind of each semester, but probably especially each summer, we're gonna need to go through and kind of update. And, and some of that's great motivation because we wanna keep our resources current and we have a lot of uh, kind of motivation to do that, but it's gonna need to be done uh, on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of where we're at. I think it's gone really bit, uh, really well, but I think it's a good point to kind of take a step back and do a little uh, cost benefit analysis, uh, thinking about OER implementation. So certainly there were a lot of what I would consider more one-time costs, although maybe not exactly one time, but substantially one-time costs, like doing initial question bank development. Uh, that was, that took a ton of time. Uh, and uh, will continue to take time, creating new assignments. 
this was really great. We had had varieties of assignments in the past, but we really were thoughtful and we really thought, okay, how can we make these relevant? How can we connect with students? We did a lot of work and a lot of kind of review and thought on our assignments, gathering new resources, doing this kind of implementation, this initial implementation. But we also recognize there's gonna be these kinds of ongoing costs I'm talking about, continual refinement, updating and developing course materials. So I think probably one of the things with the OER is the work is never done. Uh, this is something that we will just continue to work with. And that's great. On the one hand, you don't get stuck with kind of old textbook and old ways of doing things, but you need to keep at it. Uh, I think the clear benefits, though, are just amazing. Cost savings to students around $80 per student. Collectively, just for our SOS 101 students, if we extrapolate that to around 650, 700 students, um, well, probably 750, 800 if we include summer as well, uh, over $50,000 per year saved. And that's real money if we just think about that's no longer going out of state to some for-profit textbook publisher. This is money that's staying with our students uh, and that really is substantial. I think with that too, it's important to kind of frame that in terms of equity and access, especially for our rural students, for low SES students and for first generation college students. And with that, I think it's also important to note that a lot of times, as I was mentioning earlier, students simply didn't buy expensive textbooks or they would try to share or try to borrow. Uh, and that obviously had really substantial issues for learning, especially if some of our students really just didn't have access to the materials. So we're seeing greater learning, greater engagement just by having these free materials. Uh, another thing with that is the immediacy of availability. So a lot of times we'd have students waiting on financial aid before they could buy the textbook or simply hadn't gotten around to buying the textbook. And this was especially true for early college students. So we have these students out in high schools who are joining uh, like synchronous online uh, with our instructors. Uh, eliminating this barrier was really big for them and being able to get high school students on board and accessing our courses right away. And then I think kind of another benefit, it's also a cost, but another benefit is simply we have motivation to keep this course up to date, motiv motivation for continued customization. Uh, but I think this has been really great. So really just want to wrap up with just a few uh, quick leadership lessons, things that I'm taking away that might be, or that might be kind of broadly applicable for other units and, and individuals doing OER, thinking about OER. One of the things that's really has struck me is that OER may often be an incremental process. And I was really kind of reflecting on this the last week as I was putting this together, that without our earlier 2019 standardization and redevelopment efforts, we likely would not have been ready uh, to bite this whole process off, you know, to go for it all at once and to jump into OER. And so I think it might be helpful for units to think about courses like this in terms of multi-year transition processes or thinking, what are the steps to getting where we need uh, to go? Uh, kind of another, just a big reality is the need for adequate resources. So beyond just faculty, especially my time, but other faculty, we spent as a department several thousand dollars in direct and equivalent labor costs. So some of those were direct contracts that we paid for student labor during summer. Some of our more utilization of students on graduate assistant lines through the graduate school, substantial labor costs. And I'd say in the last year, I've invested individually probably a good 100 plus hours on this project. So no small undertakings. And uh, I, I think it's probably often a mistake to think you can do this quickly and easily with low cost. There is gonna be some substantial uh, upfront costs one way or another, however you articulate or, or think about those. But of course, it's the benefits that pay off. Finally, I think departments and units would likely benefit from having broad overall plans for thinking about affordability and access along the lines of what are three-year plans? What are five-year goals for OER within our unit? Um, how do these fit into strategic plans with regard to curriculum, enrollment, program development, especially for these multi-section gen ed courses? These are complex undertakings that often involve lots of people, um, lots of kind of thinking through the pieces ahead. I think it's important for units to think about roadblocks that they need to be navigated around, whatever those might be, funding, accreditation, other kinds of things. Think about resources and funding that would be needed. Think about incentive structures. Uh, how can we respond to uh, faculty concerns? I, I think this is also just kind of a lesson in uh, incremental discussion, decision-making, giving uh, faculty the space to think through pros and cons 
and to continue to come back to be steady in leadership, but also to provide opportunity for thorough reflection and uh, feedback. Um, finally, many OER Im implementations are unlikely, especially when we're thinking about these kind of large courses, are unlikely to be single faculty member efforts. So, some, of course, legitimately may be, but a lot of these are gonna be multi-group efforts. And really we need to think again about these kind of broader initiatives. And I think it might be great if colleges really maybe were to ask programs and departments to develop long-term OER plans to think about, okay, this isn't gonna happen in one year, but what do we wanna see three years, five years, seven years down the road and think about these in broader context. So that's a uh, presentation there and I'm happy uh, to answer any questions and to talk about that. But thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? It's just so impressive because I know that it's hard to get all the faculty in a unit to head the same direction, especially implementing it in the curriculum. Any tips on how to how to help that gel so that everyone gets to the same level of technical expertise to use the course materials? I think there's a lot of you, there's maybe a kind of a couple of different questions there. So I think kind of initial decision-making process, I think some of the things that really motivated us and that helped us get on the same page was really our kind of, I'd say, philosophical commitment to, uh, to equity and to increasing affordability for our students. So that was a really powerful argument within our unit. The idea that um, w when we realized or when faculty realized that a lot of students were simply not buying the textbook because they couldn't afford to and that that was having a direct impact on their education, that became a, a really powerful motivating argument. So I think thinking through uh, those kinds of things and having the discussions. I, I think, again, the fact that we had done a pretty substantial process a couple of years earlier, we were really in the habit of working through these things. I'm sure for a lot of units, the questions of, like uh, autonomy versus standardization are huge questions with all kinds of ramifications for you know, academic freedom and, and these kinds of things. Um, and I, I don't know if there's easy answers to that, but it's, I think those are really engaged conversations that need to be had. I think probably in a lot of departments, units, it might be the kind of thing where there's gonna to need to be some kind of balance where we say, okay, here's an area where as faculty, we can, maybe not everyone gets to design the course exactly like we want, but we can really see the value in coming together and doing this course. And I'm guessing for a lot of courses, it'd be like the gen ed, like, hey, let's do this and do this well. Uh, and then there's going to be these other courses where we're going to really have that opportunity for faculty to maybe teach in particular kinds of ways. I think that on the technical side, once you've made that decision, you need to invest resources or time for, for training, uh, for getting people up to speed. Uh, and that's, that's just no small task. Uh, you know, I always try to tell faculty, on the one hand, so you're going to be a SOS 101 instructor. Great. There's a couple things that come with that. On the one hand, we're essentially handing you a course. So you're not gonna have to spend a ton of time developing the course, but you are gonna have to spend time learning how to teach the course. So it's a little bit of a different operational philosophy. You, you're not gonna, you know, so especially with like adjunct instructors or TAs, we're kind of shifting the workload, learning how to do it as, a, as opposed to doing all the design work. That's a great question. Thank Cindy, you. did you have a question? Yeah, first of all, thanks for all of your work, Jeremy. It sounds like you just did a tremendous service to not only our students, but to the university for being willing to sort of take this on. Um, but my question is, um, you had mentioned that you'd seen greater learning and potentially greater success. Um, and I so... Anyway, do you have any sort of evidence of that, any way that you're seeing that? Or well, that, that that's a great question. I kind of knew you were going that way. Uh, and uh, just, just one really, an enrollment increases. Did, did that, was that an impact? Was that impacted at all? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, so we, we implemented in uh, this last 
fall, the new OER version. So a lot of those registration decisions were, of course, made a year ago in spring. Uh, and I'm not, yeah, I think we actually had announced, but I'm, I'm not sure that students really had a conceptualization of that. What we found out though this fall and impacted registration for this spring was, uh, it, I think it clearly, now to some extent, like, so like spring 22 over spring 21, uh, enrollment is up across our social 101 sections. Now there's a lot of, you know, there's kind of other factors, of course, that would lead to overall enrollment. But one of the things that we did here and that we saw, we saw right at the beginning of the fall semester during the first 10 days during drop ad is we had students who had, so a student would be in social 101 with no textbook costs and they had friends in other uh, uh, objective uh, six gen ed. And those objective, other objective six gen eds had textbook costs. And we heard, I mean, it was anecdotal, but we heard multiple cases where students are like, I do not want to pay this $100 textbook. I am switching over to Social 101. Uh, and then we heard, we heard multiple times kind of last um, uh, October, November, when we were talking to students about registration. Uh, I think it clearly makes a, uh, it's, it's an impact on the decisions students, uh, students make. And beyond that, we heard really good feedback just on kind of overall course design. Now, uh, in terms of kind of assessing, we have some uh, we have some GERC data that I think supports the idea that um, kind of student learning was a bit up. I think it's a little bit harder to gauge exactly. Um, I think some of that again is kind of anecdotal from an instructor perspective, like say the kinds of uh, discussions and conversations that they're having within class or the way students are, are responding to uh, assessments or grades. I think we have some evidence uh, for, for that. So I, I think we can get better, we need better data points, but I think the initial evidence all points to that. Thank you. So, oh, go ahead, Sandy, please do. Okay, um, questions about platform and rights. Um, sharing. Did, did you use Pressbooks or something else? And did you put it out under Creative Commons license? For, for so we had the OER uh, textbook. We had links to say newspaper articles on the web or links to uh, YouTube video. But we do have a couple um, journal articles. I think just two that are, are hosted within Moodle, but almost all of our uh, kind of supplemental materials are uh, links to publicly available uh, material. We, we also did some kind of some interesting things where we had, um, like I think we have an assignment where we ask students to uh, like view a film of their choice that they already have access to. Uh, through say a streaming service or some other kinds of things. So to some extent, we're kind of, um, uh, and we have a number of assignments like that, which go out and ask students to collect uh, or to utilize resources that they have access to kind of through public web access. So that's generally the way we have done um, supplemental resources. Uh, of course, as I was alluding to, those uh, kind of public resources could disappear at any time. And so that does kind of require uh, kind of a, a dynamic response or, you know, continuing to update those kinds of things. Right. Thank you. So, so with um, your, your main textbook, it's OpenStax, is that's where, it, that's where yes. it's hosted? On that? So the OpenStax is both, uh, it's accessible via HTML on a, you know, you can link to like each chapter has a link. But you can also, they also have a PDF that you can download. Students can download a PDF of the entire textbook or PDFs of individual chapters. So that's been helpful for maybe students that don't have the greatest uh, internet access. They could download when they're on campus, they could download the entire textbook and utilize that free forever. Uh, other students uh, just rely on HTML within, within a web browser. So that's nice that they have both options. And also, well, I would say this too. They can also download it for free on a, if they have a Kindle device through Amazon, that's another option. And they can actually, they can purchase the physical text. So that, that's, that's a kind of a good 
point to bring up. The, the uh, bookstore does stock a limited selection. I think, I don't know what the bookstore price, but they can buy it off Amazon, I think for $22, a physical uh, a text. So we, my sense is we have a few students, not many, but we have a few students that uh, like the physical text and they can get that. I think it's low $20. So we were glad that for those students who prefer to have a physical textbook, that is a low cost option if someone were to want that. Um, let me ask a follow-up question to that as well. Um, so you say that the, the main textbook, that third edition of that intro to sociology uh, text, uh, um, is hosted on the OpenStax, right? Um, did you adapt that or, or rewrite that, or do you just link to it? We, we just link to it. Now, one of the things... Uh, so one of the things that's very common, like in an intro to sociology text, is there is often vastly more material than what's realistic to cover. And th this is the case with for-profit textbooks. So the, the OpenStax, I want to say, has like 20-something chapters. It's very, it's very common in our discipline to kind of think about these as you're going to cover roughly a chapter a week. That's kind of how they're designed. And so very commonly, like in textbooks of all kinds, you tend to have about eight or nine very standard chapters that you see, like if you go to take Social 101, any university across the country, we're going to cover these nine topics in roughly that order, nine chapters. And then you tend to see about five or six chapters that vary a lot from institution to institution. So I think one of the things we'll continue to do is we might be do something similar where we might select different chapters. So we might use like chapters one through eight and then chapter 12, 15, 19, 21, something like that. Uh, I don't know, we, you certainly could do, uh, and the licensing is you could do modification of the text itself and OpenStax supports that. So if, if you wanted to uh, do a modified text, I think they will host it. I think there's some ways to do that. We haven't had the capacity to customize at that level and I don't, know that we will, but that is an option. This is all really good information. Um, thank you so much for uh, presenting today and thanks for answering questions. Um, I, I think you've answered so many questions and, and this is really helpful. Uh, let me maybe ask one final question. Uh, sure. Was there anything that surprised you um, as you look back that you hadn't anticipated that just caught you off guard or? Well, you know, I, th I think when, if like a year ago or when we first set out, before we looked at particular OER textbooks, a lot of our faculty, and I included, had the concern, what would the quality be like of OER materials? And, and to, I, I guess I would preface this to say that we had occasionally thought about this in years past. Um, and OpenStax had a second edition of the textbook that was from 2015. So, the, you know, it was a much older. And when we were doing that kind of a redevelopment in 2019, we gave that some look, but we kind of felt like it wasn't as strong as we wanted. However, we were, when we went and looked at the third edition, we were, and I was substantially impressed and felt like the quality had increased. Uh, of course, it was, it was more up to date and it was more extensive. And so I think the takeaway or the thing that was surprising was just that I think the quality of the OpenStax is good. Is, is, you know, I don't know that I'm in a position to say it's better, um, but I think is at least comparable to other textbooks. Uh, and so I, I think that was, you know, I don't know how surprising that was, but it was at least, uh, you know, reassuring that we felt like this was a, a good option and I think part of that too was just kind of at the disciplinary level or across higher ed. I think there's been big energy, a lot of energy in the last five, six years where instructors, institutions all over the place say, hey, there's been a tipping point. And now we're really going to, we know that we want to have quality OER and, and institutions, even individual authors are, are investing that in that in stronger ways. Um, so I, I think like the OpenStax has a, is a multiple author model where individual chapters are written by different groups, um, as well as overarching coordination. And so I think there's just been more willingness on, say, 
I mean, part of faculty at various institutions to say, even though they're not getting compensation for it, there we put together a team to write a chapter for an open access textbook. And that is, I think, increasingly seen as valuable um, from a number of different perspectives. So I, I, think, I think there's really uh, energy and, and movement here toward really sustainable, sustainable high quality OER materials. So I'm excited for that. I think that's definitely the future, at least for sociology. Well, that does sound really exciting to hear that uh, you're, where you may have had uh, reservations about quality before, that seems like that's been addressed with mm -hmm. recent changes to recent editions. And um, I'm, I'm a bit curious um, if you think that um, that might be unique to your discipline, or do you think that's more um, widespread even outside your discipline, you know, the multi-authors uh, for a single chapter? And I, so I mean, I, I think it is growing. I mean, certainly um, it's going to be these very, these high adoption gen ed intro courses where I think you're going to see the most support for that. Um, it's probably like in, in disciplines that are accredited, it's probably gonna be less likely or certification style programs. Um, but I, I think sociology has a lot of kind of reasons going for that, but I think we're gonna see uh, adoption more broadly. I mean, part of it is just, is kind of like thinking about uh, a lot of the introductory material in sociology hasn't, you know, like kind of key theoretical concepts are not all that different than they were 30, 40 years ago. So it's not like you need, uh, once you have a good intro text, intro chapter, say, you know, chapter one, two, and three, um, doing that and getting that well, there's going to be a lot of payoff for years to come. Yes, we want to kind of keep those up with updated with current events, but the discipline is not changing so fast that like somebody's work goes out of date immediately. So I, I think there's opportunity to say, hey, investment here really pays off. And I think it's part of the broader kind of national conversation about just increasing access and affordability and recognizing that, I, I think at least for sociology, that's just been on everyone's minds for the last decade plus, that education is a, is a stratified or that it is not equally available to different groups and wanting to find ways to make high quality materials more affordable. And so I think we've seen good action on that. And I would also say it's been supported by the American Sociological Association. It's our professional organization. And they have put efforts and support and money in, in, in resources into that in various ways. So I think it's kind of a collective realization and broad endeavor there within sociology. That's fascinating. It's, it's pretty exciting to hear that, uh, that there is momentum and inertia uh, moving forward with these initiatives. Well, one more time, thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has uh, questions, we, we can let you ask questions or make comments. But I, I feel like uh, this might be a good stopping point for, for each of us. So, um, All right. Th thank you so much, Spencer, and uh, glad to participate. Absolutely. Thank um, you great so much. that ISU is doing this, and I, I'm really excited to see more opportunities like this. And um, if, if anyone else uh, in this meeting is interested, we have an 8.30 uh, uh, textbook hero presenting tomorrow. And then um, let me look at my schedule real quick. Uh, we have another textbook hero on Thursday at 10 o'clock a.m. And then another, our final, oh yeah, that, that is our final one, is at 10 a.m. on Thursday. <laughs> I'm getting confused with our OA, OAER meeting that's uh, thurs on Thursday. <laughs> um, anyway, well, thank you once again. Uh, I appreciate your time and, and thank you for presenting. It's been really fascinating. I really enjoyed uh, uh, learning more about your experience using uh, OAER materials. So, uh, well, with that, uh, we'll say thank you and we'll, we'll talk to you later. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.